So welcome to uh, Flojo's monthly webinar series. My name is Tim Crawford. I'm an application scientist with Flojo. If you have any questions while we're going through the materials, please take a look at the chat box. Um, all panelists, yeah, so, ooh, and attendees, that's right. So welcome, and please type in All right, so welcome and please type any questions that you have into chat. Can everybody hear me? If so, you can type yes or you can raise your hand. Um, if you have a question, I will periodically be looking back at the questions in the chat box and answering them step by step. And what we're gonna do today is go through the process of concatenating and running a, um, ooh, in, great in uh, concatenating and running dimensionality reduction using the T-stochastic neighbor embedding um, t CNE algorithm in Flojo version 10. And so what we'll do is I'll go through the process via a slide deck, uh, just explaining the step-by-step, -step, and then we'll jump back and forth to an actual Flojo workspace uh, where I'll do the process live for you and uh, follow along. So let's go ahead and talk about the, the whole process. Again, can everybody hear me okay? Let's see. My participants list here and yes, okay. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate that feedback. Okay, so um, again, my name is Tim Crawford. My email is timc at flojo.com. I'm the central US application scientist. I also cover Canada. If you have any science questions or questions about the topics that I've gone through, feel free to email me. I can also provide you with the training slides that I'm presenting today as a reference uh, for your use in the future. So export and concatenate is the process of merging multiple files into a single file. Um, it allows you to take several different samples or different tubes that you've acquired on your cytometer and actually merge them together into a single new FCS3 standard file. Um, so there are two basic options. The, 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 the export concatenate functionality is found under the file tab of your Flojo workspace. Under the document band, there is a function called export slash concatenate. And if you click on that button, you will find two options. One is export or concatenate populations. That would be when you highlight a specific gated population in one or more in, in more than one sample, and you want to merge those samples together to form a new file. Um, or merge those populations, or you can export concatenate a group. This would be at the root level of the file, so you wouldn't be actually concatenating or merging gated populations, but you'd be merging root level um, files with all of the events contained therein. And so when you want to um, concatenate or merge these files together, you will select the samples or the gated populations and then initiate the concatenate process by clicking on this export concatenate either populations or group option and it will open up this window in the bottom right hand corner which is a uh, export or concatenate um, user interface window the first option will be to the first thing you'll need to do is click on the concatenate tab instead of export because you will want to actually merge using the concatenate file and then select a format from the drop down list my suggestion for everyone, if you want to bring the file back into Flojo so that you can perform dimensionality reduction, is to leave the FCS3 format checked. If you uh, want to push out the, because what that will give you is a new FCS file with the raw data and a compensation matrix associated with that data. If you want to um, push out as a CSV file, you can choose to push out the actual compensated values that are, have already been corrected for fluorescence spillover. But if you want to bring it back into Flojo, use your FCS3 option. And you have a destination location where the save will occur. This will be specify where you would like that file to be written in, in, uh, on your desktop, or <clears throat> in this case, I put it on my desktop, but you can put it in any shared network drive. And then we have a bunch of other options. So always include all events. Um, the parameters will be 
left as all uncompensated parameters in this case because we do not want to actually export the corrected compensated data. We actually want the raw data plus a compensation matrix. So you want the uncompensated parameters. It will come with the comp matrix um, when, it, when the file is written, just like a normal FCS file. Then you have some advanced options for naming. You can give a prefix or a suffix that is unique to the file that you are concatenating. And there are options on the right-hand side under advanced options to concatenate all files together, concatenate every specified n number of files, so you can do four at a time, or concatenate files with equal keyword values. This would be like if you wanted to concatenate a group of 20 files together, but each there's a there are five patients, and so you could say concatenate all of the same files with the same patient IDs together. You can also add additional new parameters when you concatenate or merge files. Additional parameters are keywords, that's metadata information, such as in this case the stimulation condition I've chosen. To add as a new parameter, this will separate out the files into the groups based on the keyword uh, labels that you've given it. So if I give my condition a designation of one, two, three, or four, depending on how I've stimulated or treated those samples, then I can pull apart each of those conditions, even if there are multiple files in there with the same condition, they'll be merged together. I'll show you where, where we're going with this. All right, concatenate groups, same deal, except that you just highlight the group instead of individual files. And what we're gonna do is actually merge these together so that we get a group of files together in a new FCS file. And so in this case, uh, the sample ID versus APC size 7 plot, this is a merged concatenated file where I actually ran uh, some beads stained with an APC size 7 antibody uh, conjugated fluorochrome or fluorochrome conjugated antibody. And I, what I'm doing here is titrating up the voltage on the photomultiplier tube, the, do, the, detect, the detector for APC size 7. And as I increase in voltage, the separation increases between the negative and the positive fraction, the stained versus the unstained events. And after you get up to a certain point, you get this spreading effect that is due to the increased um, yeah, PMT voltage, but obviously you don't get better separation. So there's a sweet spot in the detector here is what I'm looking at. And I can visualize this very easily by showing all of those samples together in one concatenated file output. Over on the right is what I'm gonna do today with you guys. I've got a single patient that's been um, where I have PBMC, peripheral blood mononuclear cells that have been stimulated for different lengths of time with a mitogen. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna merge these samples together and then do an entire dimensionality reduction on all of the samples together in order to uh, be able to compare the changes that are occurring in that dimensionally reduced data space. Now to do this type of down um, of, of concatenation and TCNE dimensionality reduction, I'm gonna use plugins. And plugins are Java programs that come with Flojo. There's five plugins that you'll see in your uh, plugins menu under the workspace tab. There's a populations band with a plugin dropdown menu. And these come with the new installation of Flojo. If you download the newest version of Flojo, you'll find that there's a plugins uh, folder and that contains those five plugins. And if you just follow the installation instructions, you will find that those plugins are available now under the workspace tab plugins menu. Now I'm gonna use two plugins, the down sample plugin and the TSME plugin today to do this process in addition to concatenation. Down sample creates a gate containing a limited number of events that are evenly selected across the entire time uh, slice of, of the sample. So they are uh, basically, a uh, random selection from the parent population, so you get a down sample population with fewer events, but it still reflects the same um, phenotypes and, and functional properties that you would see in, in the entire file. And then TSNE, which is a dimensionality reduction algorithm, which is going to create two new dimensionally reduced parameters, a 2D parameter. Um, what we will do is take each of the samples, we're going to add some gates, which I've already done, down sample to a specified number of events on a certain gate, and then merge those together using concatenation. Then we'll run T and E, and we'll pull apart each of the individual samples from that concatenated file to take a look at them. These other additional plugins, SPADE, Flow Means, and Cell Ontology, these are useful 
downstream of TCNE, SPADE for clustering, cell ontology for querying uh, what, what, if you don't know what your uh, phenotype represents. But these additional three SPADE flow mean cell ontology plugins require the R statistical computing environment. And you have to set up R and download the packages for these, po uh, for these algorithms before using them. Now, when you run a plugin, I know it's a very wordy side, but slide, but it just says, if you run a plugin, you'll be asked to save your workspace. And then each time you run a plugin operation, a file out is put in a derivative folder that's named the same as your workspace and saved in the same location as the workspace. And every time you run a plugin, you'll get some sort of external file that's produced and it will be saved in that derivatives folder. So downsample, as I said, is very simple. Uh, you select a limited number of data points from a, sim uh, from a sample or gated population. And in, in order to initiate that, downsample mechanism, you select a sample node or a gated population. In this case, I've already gated out bad doublet cells, and I've uh, isolated only the small lymphocyte population, and then selected or isolated using a gate only live events based on a live dead um, dye discriminating reagent. So I am isolating the live events by highlighting the single node that I've highlighted, uh, that I've selected here. And then from the workspace tab, I'm going to select my plugins drop down and select down sample. It'll bring up this user interface where you select the number of events and you can give your population a, a unique name. Click OK and you'll get a down sample gate like is shown down here. Down sample DP pop is the default where you get 5,000 events. Um, contained within that population, representing a slice of the live uh, population that I've that I've done. Um, so, so why don't we go ahead and go through the concatenation process, and then I'll talk about TCNE with you in more detail. Um, TCNE is an algorithm for dimensionality reduction. It creates two new parameters which separate out that data into a dimensionally reduced data data space. My God, stop calling me. Um, <laughs> sorry, my phone is ringing off the hook there. Allow, and, and a lot of people use this as part, uh, as a first step so you can look at all of the phenotypes in the same dot plot instead of doing a hierarchical gating where you do you gate on one phenotype, one, another phenotype. Uh, you can only use two parameters at a time. Well, this takes into account all the parameters that you dimensionally reduce using the algorithm. And here I've taken a 15 parameter data file and I've actually dimensionally reduced it using TCNE. And what I've done is gate on known phenotypes. Um, in green are the, just to demonstrate the uh, separation of the different, uh, the different subsets within this sample. In green is all the CD4 cells, but in the node that is dark green here that I'm circling with my mouse, those are the Tregs. And they, they parse out into a specific node or a little peak here um, that shows that they are similar in phenotype based on the uh, antigens that we've measured with this with this 15 color panel. The brown cells here are the are the CD8 positive T cells and then we've got some memory cells in dark brown. We've got some natural killer cells and some activated NKs over here that are in dark red and then some B cells in blue. So very clearly just using the basic lineage markers you can separate out all your lineages and depending on how deep your panels go, what kind of um, antigens you're interrogating, you can get down to very, very small populations with subtle differences in antigen expression. But all of that information is included in this single 2D plot with the TCNE algorithm. So let's go ahead and jump back here. What I'm going to do is jump over to my workspace and I'm going to double check if there's any questions. Okay. Um, <clears throat> where I have four samples. I have four samples in here that I've described. These are, this is a simple time course where I've um, stimulated PBMC from a single patient. So the LD1 is the nomenclature for my patient ID. And then these different no stim and stim um, designations depend on, uh, on what type of stimulation combination these uh, cells got. And so the no stim sample if we look at live events, let's say, and look at CD3, let's take a look at uh, interferon gamma here real quick. 
So interfering gamma isn't expressed very robustly. It's on the y-axis in the CD3 or positive or negative populations in the absence of stimulation. But if I go through here and look at the two-hour stimulation, you can see the nice upregulation or robust expression of interfering gamma from some T cells and from your natural killer cells here. And so what we're going to do is start by doing a down sample on the live node. I've got some other gates in here, but they don't really matter. What matters is that we want to merge the live events together. And seeing how I have about 200 and uh, over 200,000 live cells per sample, I'm not gonna merge all of them together to run T-CNE on. I'm actually going to do that down sample population mechanism under workspace, plugins. Here is my down sample option. And I'm gonna reduce the number of events in that gated live population, uh, make a new child population containing something reasonable so that the TCNE algorithm takes just a couple minutes to, con uh, to complete. Uh, TCNE is a very memory intensive algorithm. And so if you try and throw 100,000 or 200,000 events at it, you'll be waiting a while before the parameters um, become visible, um, calculated and available to you. So for the sake of time, I'm gonna start with just 5,000 events here and I'm gonna click OK and they get this down sample population. So every time you run a plugin, you get some sort of node that says what you did. So this is down sample of live and this is actually an operation that I can drag and drop to a gated population somewhere else. So, and it'll create this down sample DP pop. So what I'm gonna do is grab the down sample of live and I'll drag it to the next live node here. I could do this at the level of the gating tree upstairs too um, in the group menu. Uh, but then I end up with this down sample population. Oh, I didn't mean to drag this gates in there. Uh, but I have a down sample population here and a down sample population there. I'm going to do it two more times. Just going to grab this down sample of live, bring it to the live node, and it'll calculate my new down sample population on that sample, and then once more down sample on live. So now I've got these four gated populations that are all named the same thing, and they're all downstream of um, the, the live sample. So what I want to do is take my down sample DP pops and select all of them. And I can do this in two ways. Either I can hold down my command modifier key on my Mac and select multiple populations one at a time, and this works just fine if I'm only dealing with four populations, but if I've got 20 or um, more samples that I'm dealing with, there's also a mechanism if you right click, if you select a single sample uh, gated population node and right click, you can select the equivalent nodes that are in the same point in the gating hierarchy. And selecting equivalent nodes will then highlight in one motion, one right click, select and select equivalent nodes, will highlight all of those populations that are the same name there, down sample DB pop on the live node. So now I have all four populations selected. Now I'm gonna go to my file tab and select export concatenate. I'll open this workspace up so you can see the full icon here. Export concatenate under the file tab. And it allows me to select either populations or group. I'm gonna do the populations because I wanna only get the live events in there that I had selected in my downsample DP pop gated populations. Selecting export concatenate populations will bring up this interface that allows me to select all of the uh, properties for my export or concatenate save. Now export is the default when you open this up and if you notice in the bottom it says a status box where it says this operation will generate a four new data files. So this export operation would only export the downsample DP pop events as individual files. We'll not merge them together. What we need to do is first select the concatenate tab, select concatenate, and then it gives us a status that says this operation will generate one new data file. So it shows you, it tells you how many data files you're going to expect out of this. So what I'm going to do is open up these advanced options. It's a expandable um, box down at the bottom. And it allows me to give some new names. Remember, and, and I'm gonna just label with a suffix for this file, the LD1, in this case, um, the patient ID nomenclature. Remember that you just want to, if you could bring it back into Flojo, 
you concatenate or export, you want to export as a FCS3 format. There are some other CSV options, but we don't want to do those unless you're going outside of Flojo and into some other program. So FCS3 is our format. I'm going to put this in the destination that I select. It's going to be on my desktop. And then I want to include all events. I've already done down sample here. And I want to include all uncompensated parameters. And really important, if you want your gating tree to apply to the new concatenated file, to leave this parameters as all uncompensated parameters. It's the number one thing that people, or mistake that people make is they choose the compensated parameters. But you don't want compensated numbers. You want the raw data. It will come with a matrix, a compensation matrix. If there's one attached to the original data, the new file will come with that matrix as well. So just leave those alone. Give your uh, file a name. And then in this case, I'm going to keep the concatenate all files together. But remember, I could concatenate every n number of files or concatenate files together based on their keywords. What I will do here is choose an additional parameter so that I can pull these files apart. This is, again, keyword information. This is metadata that I've labeled on the front end when I acquired the data. And um, I put these, this information in so I can pull it out after the fact and use it to merge all this flow data into a database. But I have a, a condition or a stim um, keyword here. And so I can select the stim condition keyword. So I'll get a new parameter when I concatenate these together that I can select called stim that will pull apart the files into individual conditions. Now, you always get a sample ID parameter, which will do the same thing. So I'll show that to you in just a moment when we write the file. Now that I have all my options set up for concatenating as FCS3, including all events, all uncompensated parameters, all files together with a new parameter, I'm going to generate one new file. I'm going to press the concatenate button, and it's going to write the file. And then what I'll do is open up. I'll select the existing workspace, which is the one I'm working on. It'll just, when I close this dialog, it'll bring that file in. Otherwise, you can open it in a new workspace or just close it, and it will just have the file um, on your disk. But when I open, when I close this, selecting existing workspace, then that new file gets loaded in. I'm going to close the concatenate dialog. Now I have five files in my, in, in my workspace here. Because I'm using inclusion criteria for this group called gates, I get that file automatically included. So concat1 LD1 is my new concatenated file here. And uh, it gets all of the gates. And you'll notice that the gating is 100%. The frequency of parent is always 100% up through the live node because I'm only including events contained within that, that, that gating hierarchy. Um, because I downsampled on the live node and included only live events. I've got full 100%. There's 20,000 events total. And then at the CD3 level, if we look here, it'll start um, getting smaller in terms of frequency of parent because I'm actually getting down to populations of interest. Now, if we go ahead and look at the concatenated file, as I've done here in a graph window, double clicking will open up a graph window. And I take a look at the drop down options for our. Uh, Parameters, you will find two new parameters. One is a sample ID parameter, and this is automatically created every time you concatenate files together. Um, and it will be, the, the files will always be ordered in the same order as your workspace list here. So in this case, LD1, no stim, 20 minute, two hour, two hour, and 20 minute is the time course here. And that's the same order that they will appear in the concat file if I select sample ID. So here's sample ID that separates the events from each individual file, and it allows me to gate on those individual events. So now I can separate out the individual events from each sample. So I'm going to call this no stim condition. And then I'll do a uh, couple more gates here, just stim1, stim2, stim3. And notice how I've normalized using down sample the number of events going into this concatenation process. This is important downstream if I want to uh, consider how the samples are changing over time in this assay. I'm going to call this next one STEM1, then STEM2, and STEM3, and STEM4. STEM2, and STEM3.
All right, so I've got my gates here on this concatenated file. I'm doing it on the live node. So there's my no stim gates, and they each contain 25% almost. Move that over. And that's what I'd expect because I'm expecting 5,000 events per sample. And there's one up here somewhere. Um, so now I have all of those gates. Now what I'm going to do is go ahead and initiate this TCNE algorithm on the uh, data set that I've just merged together using the concatenation process. And this will give us two new dimensionality, dimensionally reduced uh, parameters that represent all of the data in a single plot. So I'm going to go to my plugins. First I select the sample I want to use TCNE on. And then I'm going to select the TCNE option from the plugins menu under the workspace tab. Here within the TCNE menu, we'll go back to this again. I'll go back to the slides while it's running. I'm going to select the parameters I want to dimensionally reduce. So remember that we want to use the compensated parameters, that's the corrected ones, um, with the comp matrix applied. And I'm generally not going to use any parameters that I didn't stain for. In this case, I have one extra blank parameter that did not get a fluorochrome antibo uh, conjugated antibody, and so it doesn't represent anything. I'm not going to use my ARD, my live dead reagent, because I've already used it in the gating tree to identify live cells. Instead, I'm going to take the, in this case, eight parameters that I have that are phenotypic, and I'm going to run this, but I'm going to make a few changes. Just one change to, uh, to this, the, the settings of the algorithm. The iterations is the number of cycles the algorithm goes through. And I know from experience with this data set that um, things, everything separates pretty well at about 550 iterations. And if you let it go longer, uh, the data will get further and further apart. So the continents of the end result will look further and further apart and not be like, a, like one continent structure. Um, the perplexity is the number of events that each event pushes and pulls off of as the algorithm is calculating. And so I'm gonna leave that at 20, but I might include, uh, increase the perplexity if I had larger numbers of parameters um, and I was using a higher parameter file in this case. I can choose to generate a movie and then take a look at it. So sometimes you just might wanna leave the 1000 iterations and keep the movie checked and then we'll come back and take a look at the movie over time. To initiate the algorithm calculation, I choose selected parameters, bottom right corner, and this will initiate the calculation where you'll see right here a node with a star, so it's TCNE and that it's calculating. So that's going to take a couple minutes, and we'll get back to that. Okay, so we've merged that file. Now we're dimensionally uh, dimensionality reducing the file, creating new parameters. Going back here, I also have a stim condition parameter. You can see that when I select that, it separates out the files. If I look at a functional marker here, um, such as the phosphorylation of the extracellular signal regulated kinase, uh, MAP kinase signaling molecule, under no stim, that's very low. The phosphorylation of ERK is very low. If you stim for 20 minutes with a mitogen cocktail, ERK shoots up, and if you give longer stims, then the, pot, the, 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 the uh, MFI goes down a little bit, but the cells remain positive over long periods of time, two hours, two hours and 20 minutes. If I look at another functional marker in this assay, interferon gamma, you'll see the expression of interferon gamma from natural killer cells and cytotoxic T lymphocytes under the longer periods of stimulation. So you don't get expression of a cytokine that fast after 20 minutes, but you do get it after two hours and two hours and 20 minutes. And so what I'm showing you here are the functional markers that are changing over time between these different individual samples. And what we're going to use TCNE and the gating for the different stim conditions is to take all of our phenotypes into account in one plot and then we'll pull apart each of the individual component files here and see how the phenotypes change due to the phosphorylation of a signaling molecule and the expression of interferon gamma under the longer stim conditions.
All right. So while that's calculating, again, it'll take a couple minutes here, even with 20,000 events in my uh, MacBook Pro. That's why I say limit the number of events you're starting with. We'll get to that. Um, so as I've gone through here and I've shown you, in order to initiate dimensionality reduction on a sample or a gated population, you want to highlight that sample or gated population and then go to your workspace tab, plugins menu, select the TCNE option from that plugins menu, and then you will get a user interface window where you can select the options, well, the parameters that you want to use for the dimensionality reduction and the options for the algorithm. I would only play with initially the iterations and perplexity options unless you really know the math behind the algorithm. Um, leave ETA and theta alone. You can generate a movie, click choose selected parameters, and it runs. So what is the endpoint of TCNE? It creates two new derived parameters. The derived parameters are optimized in a way that the data points that were close together in the raw high dimensional data space are now close together in this dimensionally reduced data space. So here I've done the exact process that I'm showing you where I've dimension, well, I've, I've, I've taken uh, live events, downsampled them to uh, each live event from the four samples that I loaded to, to 5,000 events and then merged them into a concatenated file. Then I've run TCNE to generate two new derived parameters. They'll show up under the sample as A over B, and then it'll have a TCNE X versus TCNE Y. It shows the perplexity, uh, iterations, ETA, and all of the, the, the general properties of the algorithm that you've set um, there in the, in the naming scheme. So you can run this over and over again to get your, your beautiful content. Now, I'm gonna to have to pull this apart. And so I've got all of the events, now I'm showing you here in a little plot, all of the events together in the dimensionality reduced data space, TCNE X versus TCNE Y, and then I've gated on each of the individual stim conditions and pulled them apart. We're looking at density plots here. We can now get a very vi clear visual view of how these are different from each other, right? Control, stim one, stim two, and stim three, these are different because they've been stimulated for different lengths of time. And we have had phosphorylation of the ERK module and then cytokine expression of interferon gamma by those cells that are competent to express it. The, those changes in the phenotypes drive the events in this data space, this dimensionally reduced data space to different locations within the file. And what we'll have to do is gate on nodes here, apply them to each of the stems or vice versa, gate on nodes and take the stem and apply it to the nodes that we've gated and we'll get an idea of how those nodes are changing over time or how those populations we've defined are changing over time. Let me go back to my workspace here and we'll take a look. I keep jumping back to this view to see if there's any questions, but we're fine. Oh, I do have a, a hand raised. Um, if you can type in, Eric, to our chat box, um, your question, I'd be happy to answer it for, for you. So now I'm back here, I've got my concatenated sample and I've got these new X and Y parameters that were calculated. So if I open up that sample at the root level, make it big, we'll take a look at the TCNE X versus TCNE Y. So Y versus X here, how does this look? Nice separation. Um, between different populations. It's just a big continent-like structure or these islands that form, you know, a group of, a group of islands, as you might say. Um, however you want to describe it, pseudo color is not the best way to look at these outputs. I would recommend using a contour plot, which gives you some idea of where the peaks and the valleys are, or a density plot can also be very appealing here, where you actually get how much depth there is with all these little dense nodes. Um, so I'll leave the density plot. Yeah, keep it smooth there. And uh, we'll pull apart those individual samples and we'll find that they're very different. So how do we look at this stuff? Right? First of all, I can always create a gate on any, on this dimensionally reduced data space. And so maybe I will take a, a little 
auto gate here and I'll make a node that's just called query. I'm gonna call it Q-U-E-R-Y, query one. That's just my, my I wanna know what is contained within that, um, within that node in terms of its phenotype. So I'm gonna look at the phenotype here. And actually, I can make this a little bit bigger using my plus button. Maybe that wasn't the best auto gate. You can also just do an ellipse or any type of polygon gate to get around the node that you want. So I'm gonna use a polygon here, right? And I'll call this query two. Now I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna pull over to my layout editor and start exploring this data set and take a look at the phenotypes that are contained within these various query nodes query one and query two. So let's open up the layout editor by using this L button up in the static toolbar. It'll open up a new layout, turn off those grid lines that I got on, and I'm gonna drag my population in. My, first the root population, which shows the two parameters that I was looking at last in the graph window, along with my gates there. Now one thing I may do is duplicate this. I can right click, duplicate and move it over. And then I'm gonna drop on the two query nodes on top. So query two and query, or query one and query two. And you'll see that as I drag and drop onto the same dot plot, I get an overlay. This can be turned, the default is just a dot plot overlay, but if you right click and go to the properties menu for your uh, layout editor graph plots, we can change this into a different type of plot um, I like looking at these as contour overlays. There, so now I can see those different colors and you can always change the colors. Maybe I'll turn this one into a um, purple line, right? So we can see purple versus blue versus whatever. Now, what I'm gonna do is right click on this overlay that I've created and actually show a multi-graph histogram and it'll show me a histogram profile of every parameter in this, in this file for each population that I have in the overlay. So we'll see a red, it represents all events, and then the gated query one and query two are blue and purple respectively. So if I create histograms here, I will need to make it bigger to see everything and delete some of these guys that I'm not gonna use. So I've got some blank ones in there that I don't need. So I'm just gonna remove those and I'll be left with each parameter that is actually relevant. No dead, there. And that's all of my phenotypic parameters here. So what we can see immediately is the difference in these different phenotypes. Um, see the blue region is obviously a CD8 expressing T cell that has some CD38 on it it's C3 positive, which makes sense. And then the purple gate over here, query two up at the top, top is actually a CD4 high expressing cell. It's also CD3 positive and it's CD38 negative. And so when you have these overlays or any type of histogram, it can just be a single histogram too, I can now move these gates around in the area of the TCNE data space and explore it just by changing the gate. And so how does my query two look when I bring it over to this region down in the bottom right? That is still a CD4 cell, except it's ERK positive. So those are stimulated CD4s. If I move it over here, this is not a CD4 population. This is actually high for CD38. It's got some interferon gamma expression. It's ERK positive, it's probably a natural killer cell because it's negative for, um, oh no, it's positive for HLA-DR, which means it's, it's some sort of B cell or antigen presenting cell. And so you can, A, to explore this data space that is dimension, dimensionally reduced, create a gate or series of gates on the graph, in the graph window, and then make an overlay of those query gates for different regions or just a single region and literally, and then right click and make a multi-graph histogram to show all of the phenotypes and explore that data space simply by moving 
and in the uh, query gates to different regions, and in real time, all of that data will update. So over here, where query two is now a perforin positive, HLA-DR negative, ERK positive, it's totally a natural killer cell of some sort. If I move it over here to the other node, well, that's the stimulated natural killer cells. And so the difference here, unstimulated and stimulated between those two density points is the difference in expression of CD38, actually. So, boom, boom. Oh, no, it's, it's stimulated. It's ERK phosphorylated versus not phosphorylated is the difference there. All right, so here I'm just exploring the data space using a query gate that I can take a look at what's going on within this data space. The other way to do that is to take the gates that you already have drawn, that you know about, your hierarchy that of gating that you've already created, and do an overlay. And so let's take this concatenated root file again over here. And what I'll do is I'll take a known gated population and ask where are, say, my CD8 positive T cells. So I'm going to take my gated CD8 positive population and drag it over. And here, now I can see in blue, that's the default first color in the overlay, that everything in blue is, by my standard hierarchical gating, a CD8 positive T cell. And so then the differences within that CD8 region are going to be driven again by phosphorylation and cytokine expression in this particular data set. Where are my CD4s? CD4s here, if I drag and drop, they're in orange. So all of my orange areas are CD4. If I go and take a look at some additional, let's go ahead and gate on them. I'm going to gate on antigen presenting cells here, which are HLA-DR positive, DR positive, I'm going to call them. And uh, then we'll do CD3 negative, DR negative. And so these are going to be mostly antigen presenting cells. These are going to be mostly natural killer cells. Once I have the gating there for them, I can, right there and there, I can then again drag and drop to make an overlay and see exactly where those are located. So my DR positive population is going to be over here in green now, and my DR negative natural killer cells. So I'm getting the same answer as exploring with a query gate to see what the phenotypes are just by taking my known gating hierarchy and applying it in an overlay in the layout editor to my t -E data space, that dimensionality reduced data space. Now, how do these guys look separated? Well, I've already shown you that we drew gates based on what, stim condition? No, on, on the sample ID parameter that is created when you concatenate a file to separate out each of the individual, or a set of files to separate out the individual uh, events from each file. And we probably did the gates against some other marker. I'm thinking, I think I drew them against uh, HLADR or not. Easiest way to get back there is to open up that gate and I'll go to the parent population. <laughs> there it is. So yeah, comp ER versus sample ID is right. So I've got each of these individual component samples. So what happens when we bring there, I'll just duplicate this guy again. Duplicate and bring it down and we'll take a look. Zoom out a little bit here. I'm gonna pull in each of the individual sample files. No stem. All right, so there they are. And if I double click on those, I can change all of the parameters at the same time to the X and Y. I'm gonna go X T C E versus Y T C E. I'm gonna make this again a density plot I'll show the grid so we can see it. All right, so now we have these individual samples. Clearly, right, the unstimulated sample only comprises a very small fraction, or, you know, a 25% fraction of um, the entirety. And now we can see that those, where the unstimulated uh, events lie. And then if we look at the stimulated events, right, they have different positions here because they have literally um, been driven into different locations because of the changing phenotype due to the stimulation, in this case, the phosphorylation. And then over here in the third and fourth stim, they look almost identical because there's only 20 minute difference between these two stim periods. And so they're essentially just picking up the interferon gamma expression. And 
So the phenotypes are very similar between the last two, but they're very different between the first two. So one thing that we can do if we have any gated population, what I'm gonna do is open up the original graph here from my no stem, display the X versus Y, T and E data space. And I'll take a, a node here. We'll just take a, a node and say, well, what happens to this population? So population, nodes, yeah, just go pop one. Now 10% of the events in the no stem sample have this pop ones phenotype, whatever it is. The way I can ask how is it changing or if this population is going away or being or increasing under the stimulatory conditions is by taking my POP1 and dragging them to the other stems. But I can also do this by right-clicking and copying that node, just copy and then paste it to all three other stem conditions, paste. And you'll notice that the frequency here is now very different. In the stimulated conditions, under 20 minute stem, there's only 1% and under the others about 1%. So this 10% population, whatever it is, is changing. It's going away and those events are now moving in, you know, to a different location. I, I don't know where they're going to. There's no cause and effect here, but I do know that this population is only represented under the no stem and that it is down regulated or changed under the stimulatory conditions. I can do that whole thing instead of making individual gates, I can do the whole thing in a different way. Let me go ahead and give it a try here today. Um, what I'm gonna do is actually use the plugin called Spade, which is a clustering algorithm. And I'm gonna create a bunch of populations using Spade. I will just select the parameters that I used for TCE, &E, all eight phenotypic parameters and tell Flojo or the Spade algorithm to correct, uh, create 50 um, new populations and click OK. And we'll let that run. I'll see if I get a nice output from R. Um, what this will do is create a whole bunch of populations. And I don't know what those populations are because it's an algorithm that is creating them, but they should. What I can do is then take my gates uh, for the stem conditions and copy them to the spade populations and if any population it I know that the starting event count were equal Between the different conditions the no stem stem one stem two stem three all had 5,000 events 25% so if nothing changes between those conditions every population I create whether it be a gate that I create in a graph window manually or whether it be an algorithm derived gate such as these spade populations. I just created 50 new nodes based on spade. And I should be able to see so here it is. I want to grab each of my gates here that are 25% of the starting material and copy them and paste them here. So now, if I take any population and I take a look at the frequencies here, if there is no change, then in that population's frequency between the different conditions, then you should have equal 25% contribution to that population from every sample. If there is a change, such as in this one, this population is overrepresented under the no stem condition and underrepresented under stem three. It's only got 21 events in it, so let's take a look at something that has more events, 322 events. So here, I've got nearly 25%. It goes up a little bit under STEM1 and down in STEM2. So this phenotype, whatever it is in POP13, is going to be um, upregulated under the 20-minute STEM. And you can take a look, and then I, what, I, what I would do is actually export these through our table editor and all these numbers and, and take a look at how the changes that are occurring, what's going up and what's going down, and identify each of the populations that is going up due to the stimulation, 
or down due to the stimulation or has no change due to the stimulation. And the same goes with any type of time course and any type of phenotype you're looking at, right? There's gonna be populations of events that are upregulated due to your treatment or your condition of your, of, of your asset. And then there are some that are gonna be going down and you will be able to identify them and then phenotype them by dragging those populations over to our phenotype um, overlay as one option. All right, so I'll pull this in and obviously it gives me a population that is down over here. It's an orange and it's uh, got an HLADR. It's in the region of the antigen presenting cell population. I can call the phenotype here for each of those or I can actually take that, is that POP18, POP20. I can take that node and I can add any statistics that I want to it, such as going to my tools tab. All right, so I'm going to be under workspace there. Workspace tab add statistic, I can add medians of all compensated parameters, all compensated parameters there. And so then I'll get statistics for that node. And again, I can copy these statistics to all the other spade population nodes by selecting all of them and then copying to my spade pops. Then I can export the actual raw statistics if I want to use the actual MFIs, median fluorescence intensities, as a measurement of what's on and what's off in terms of expression pattern, you can use those statistics as well. Um, so the workflow overall is to bring your data in and clean it up in some way. So we always want to get rid of doublets. Those are events that pass by a detector two at a time. In this case, I've got a size gate on my gating hierarchy. So I'll open here. I've got Doublets discriminated using forward scatter height versus area, taking only events that are on the diagonal. Then I've got a size gate. I don't care about, in this case, the monocytes and these samples were phi called, so there are no grands. And I'm only taking the small events. So I'm using a size gate on forward scatter versus side scatter to identify just the lymphocyte population. Then I discriminate between live events and dead events. In this case, this is the dye if the, uh, that gets inside the cell if the membrane is permeable, if the cell is dead. So I remove all of the dead events to clean up just to my live events because you really only want the good, functional, happy cells. And at that point, that's where I go through the process after cleaning up of downsampling to a reasonable number of events so I can get, in this case, 5,000 events per sample. If I had more time, I could put 20,000 or even 50,000 events, but if I'm doing um, a TCNE with more than 100,000 events, it's gonna take quite a long time to get the result. So I make the downsample populations here and then select each of those downsample populations by highlighting a single downsample population node, right-clicking and selecting equivalent nodes, and it'll select all the, the nodes that have the same gating and the same name here. In, that, in the samples in that group that, I've, so that I'm on. Um, so now I've got all four together. Again, we will go to our file tab initially, and we will select export concatenate populations. Select the concatenate tab here. Leave defaults for everything. In terms of output, except if you wanna put it in your destination, it's gonna be different decide where to put it, but leave the events and leave the parameters. You can give your, uh, give, give your concatenated file a unique name, my new file, however that be. And then um, you can concatenate all of those files together and click the concatenate button, which will write the file to bring it back into the same existing workspace, check the existing workspace box and close the dialog. And now I have just made a new file called concat one, my new file. Because I have the same parameters in this new concatenated file, and I've had a group owned gating approach, because this file goes into the group called gates, it gets all of the gating, and now I have this 20,000 event population or file that I can initiate t -E or dimensionality reduction on by going to the workspace tab, plugins menu, select the TCNE algorithm, and you will select within this menu, 
um, all the parameters that you want to use for the dimensionality reduction. And again, I'm not going to use a blank or the live dead parameter in this case. Scatter parameters might be useful, especially if you're looking at any other populations. I'm only interested in lymphocytes, so I'm going to leave them out. And then I select the number of iterations and perplexity that I would like. I would say start with 1,000 and see how it goes. And if the data is spread out too much after initiating that, you can go back and watch a movie that is generated um, to see where they set all the populations separate and uh, before they uh, separate out so much that they're kind of fragmented. Choose selected parameters in the bottom right corner will initiate the algorithm and it will take however long it takes and create these new derived parameters um, called TCNE X versus TCNE Y. And ultimately, you will then be able to explore that data set by selecting TCNE X versus TCNE Y in the X and Y parameter dropdowns of a graph window. Create any number of geometrical gates and name them whatever you want, my gate, or query in this case, as I did before, and explore that by either taking on that gated population the median statistics for each parameter that you have enumerated or um, in interrogated in this in your panel. So again, that would be to go to my gate. Here's my gate one, and take I I'll add the medians in this case of all compensated parameters. And that gives me an idea of the phenotype based on central tendency of the populations there. Or I can visually explore the phenotype by taking the root population, the parent, over, and then creating an overlay by dragging and dropping other gated or um, created populations, if you're using a spade algorithm, onto your overlay. And again, this is drag and drop, drag and drop to the same dot plot in your layout editor will create an overlay and it'll give it a new color for each gate that I've created or that I've dragged on and along with a color coded legend, you can change the colors, you can change the layering. A right click on any overlay will allow you to select a multigraph histograms which I find to be the most useful. When you spread it out here, you can very easily see the differences in those different regions of phenotypes for all of your markers. And so if you're exploring by creating manual gates, you can create the overlay, right click, create histograms as a multi-graph, and see what those phenotypes are for the gates that you've created. And remember this all updates in real time. So once I've created a gate here in my workspace, I can move that gate around and all of the data changes in the layout editor to uh, reflect the actual gating within your graph window in real time. In order to pull apart the individual samples and compare them, you can separate either by selecting sample ID which will separate into individual component files, the single files that you merge together using the concatenate, or using your own keyword combination that could be something like stimulation or time point or condition, which again also just separates these out into individual files in this case. Um, and then we can actually gate on those files and pull apart each of those individual component files. But the key here that I'll reiterate it over and over again to everybody asks is that you have to merge the data together before initiating the dimensionality reduction in order to have a common data space to compare the different time points or different samples or different treatment conditions or different stimulation times. Um, anything imaginable can be compared after dimensionality reduction if you go through the process of merging those files together using your concatenate options under the file tab. So let me go ahead and ask if there are any questions here. Yes, I see a few, so let me address these. Number one, um, is there any way to color the TCNE plots based on intensity of marker expression? 
at this time there is not Eric, what I would do for that is actually take the expression profile of any given marker and make an overlay in the layout editor and basically use quartiles or fits, right? I would gate on low, medium, and high and then overlay those. I can give you the, an example of that here real quick. Let's say I want to take a look at the expression pattern of HLADR uh, across this. So I'm going to make a histogram of HLADR, and then I can make any number of gates, DR neg, let's say, All right? DR neg, DR mid, DR mid, and DR high. Um, we are, we do plan to have an actual color scheme in the graph window soon. So pretty soon you will be able to just select the color and see where these express, where everything's expressed, uh, DR high. But what I would do here is make an overlay onto one of these. Let's just duplicate this guy, move it down and drop these neg mid highs and you can make it any number of uh, shades that you would like. So Um, yeah, so most of them are negative, some of them are red, but we need to turn it into a different population. What I would probably do is go and do like a, a very light blue, or let's see, let's go light blue, middle blue, and dark blue, color scheme type of thing. And that would show me exactly where those different populations actually lie. Um, and I could do that for any number of markers using different colors that make one red, one blue, and everything, and make a really nice, if I chopped it up into various uh, additional gradients, I'd be able to make a nice uh, expression pattern of a single color over time. But what you're asking for will be available in a future graph window just with a checkbox for a third parameter for color mapping. Let's see. Um, we have... You choose 5,000 events, what's the max events the plugin could handle? I would say, Jane, um, and to all, all uh, attendees here, it, it depends on your computer. I know that I can run 20,000 events on my 2013 MacBook Pro um, in, you know, in a couple minutes, so I can demo it. If I was actually running this for analytical reasons in a, in a study, I would want to put as many events as I can and you just have to know that the length of time it takes for the TCME algorithm to, to complete depends, is directly related to the number of events that you throw at it. And so at this time, I wouldn't throw more than 100,000, maybe 200,000 at the most at a time. And this is really a discovery type of approach, not necessarily an analysis approach. So you're gonna take a representative sample using down sample and then take a look at it and extrapolate up from that. Now, having said that, we have some bioinformaticians at Flojo that are, have been improving the math and the speed. And we will very soon be releasing an update to this plugin, which will allow us to throw a million events at a time and, and have the algorithm complete in a reasonable period of time. And so it's getting better, uh, but right now I would say 100 or 200,000 events at a time. And even so, I'd run that and go on coffee break or take lunch while it's running and come back and uh, see if it's completed after, after lunch. Um, co-expressed parameters, you know, Carolyn, the question is how does TCNE deal with co-expressed parameters? And I, I'm afraid I don't have the understanding of the math behind it to really tell you exactly um, how it would deal with that. Uh, I would not be the representative. If you'd like, you can reach out to me and I can, I can ask that question uh, directly to one of my mathematician friends at the office and uh, see what type of response they, they do. But I would assume that co-expressed parameters will be just, you know, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to go into or make a hypothesis there because I wouldn't be um, truthful in my, or knowledgeable in that respect. 
So for stimulation and conditions is another question from Jane. Um, do I have to label before acquiring the data in, in order to do this in TCNE analysis? May I specify as keywords when I analyze the data? Great question. Great question. And um, we'll get to Carolyn. I'll show you where we can see the movie as well. Thank you for bringing that up. So A, keywords can be added to any workspace if you don't already have them there. They can be added, I'm gonna collapse all of my gating trees here. So you can see that the basic default is the name, statistics, and number of cells, fields within the sample, uh, samples pane of the workspace. So if I want to show more, if I already have written those keywords into the file ahead of time, I can display that information using my configure tab edit columns function. So this is first if I already have them. I'll get to your, yes, you can add them. Um, and then I have all these keywords that I've added, such as stim condition and HIV status and patient ID, and I can just bring them over to the columns to display. These are all the column values in the FCS file. These are column headers in the FCS. And then columns to display within the workspace, I can choose whatever info, piece of information from those files. In this case, I'll show, um, yeah, PID, stim, and HIV status. When I click OK, those become columns. and so these are the keywords that I used, but if you don't have them there, yes, you can make them. Under Workspace tab in the Workspace ribbon, there is an Add Keyword function. There's a Keywords band. You can click on Add Keyword, give your keyword a name, just my new keyword. You can call it Time Point, you can call it Time Course, whatever you want, right? All it needs is a numerical value to order those keywords together. One, two, three, four, right? And, and I, then you type in information, and it will then become available, that new keyword, when I go and do my whole concatenation process, which is select equivalent nodes, export concatenate populations. Now, when I choose those additional keyword parameters, because I made my new keyword, there it is, my new keyword with a value, and it will separate out the four files into the order that I choose, one, two, three, four. But interestingly, if I wanted to merge, say, another patient's four different sample files, I could give the no stim a value of one for that patient as well, and two, and three, and four. And then I will have, I, I still get the same output, which is a new keyword parameter that separates the files based on whatever nomenclature I've given them. But the two files with the same value that both have one would then be represented together in that population and the two files for the next one, and the two files for the next one. So you could merge 100 files and have 10 different conditions and 10 time points, or you know, 10 patients, 10 time points, 100 files all together um, and separate them out in any way using these labels. And again, to label a new keyword, go to your workspace tab, I'm sorry, go to your workspace tab and use the add keyword button create a new keyword, just give it a name, click OK, and you'll now have a column where you can fill in or la the labels uh, for that information. Um, Jane, the asterisk, the question from Jane is, do you have to put an asterisk before new keywords? No, but if you do, then they will all end up, every time you look for a keyword, it's gonna be in an alphabetized list, um, and if you use like edit columns here, all of the dollar sign keywords are things required by the FCS standard. And I put an asterisk simply because all of those will now, all of my keywords will group together below the dollar sign. So I have an easy way to find all of my own user entered keyword information using the asterisk, but it is not required. Just a trick I found long ago to keep everything organized. Um, one more question, where can you see the movie here? So let's go ahead and take a look at that. When I go to the concatenated file where I've run, let me collapse these, so I focus on this one, where I've got these TCNE X and Y parameters already calculated, there is, wherever you run TCNE, you will see a little star with the word TCNE. That means it's been run, and this is a platform. Um, a platform, I can drag this TCNE node to a different population and it will initiate TCNE with the same 
user inputs are the same um, options. So if you double click on a platform node like TCNE, it will bring you back to this choose selected parameters where you can rerun and overwrite the original, like if I wanted to now change this to 600, or you can actually get the movie. So the movie of previous TCNE run is a button right here. I can click on that and it will open up the movie and it will show now in five um, iteration increments the actual movement of the data. And at some point here, I'm gonna pause this. And it's because it's gonna separate out. Getting better, here it goes. All right, there's my separation, it's moving, it's moving. And so if I run this with 1000 iterations, I can kind of stop it and be like, oh, okay, I like that, right? I, I clearly have separation into different continents. If I let it go 1000 iterations, it will generally separate too much and these, uh, these different areas will become fragmented into the corners. Um, and sometimes even off scale. And so there's a sweet spot here, right? And that's what I'm doing is, is just running the movie one frame at a time, or every five frames really, stop that. And then I can select the one, I can go through it just mousing over, and I can find the point at which I think it is really good and then use that iteration, uh, number of iterations for my, um, my default for that data set. Now those movies and any other of the, any other information um, that is produced in a plugin mechanism. If you go to these plugin tools and select a plugin, there's all these data derivatives, these these files that get produced by plugins, and those are all stored. I'll go back here, move my screen so that you can't see, and I um, here is my workspace that I was working on today. There it is. So here's the workspace that I created today. And here is the plugins derivatives folder. If I open that up, you will find that within that derivative folder, there is a subfile for a folder for each plugin. Downsample, here is the four nodes that I downsample. So that's actually the information. Um, on the events that were chosen in the downsample process each time that I used it. Here is the spade information. Within spade, there is a whole bunch of, uh, of information that I'm not gonna go into at this time. There's a zip file that contains all of these files that are created by the R statistical computing environment. Um, some of them are trees, spade node trees. Some of them are network information and some of them are just a sample node attribute. So here I've actually got all of the information about the spade clusters, including the node ID, that's the population information, that's the actual relates to the populations that are created within Flojo, the event count of each of those populations, and then all of this information, including the medians of each of those populations for each parameter. And so I actually have all of the medians for the spade nodes already there. And so all I'm saying here is that every time you run, okay, and I'm getting back to it, T's and E actually has um, the movie information is contained within this, here it is, TCNE movie. And if you double click on the uh, actual link, then it'll link all of the frames, right, for each of those images. And so here I'll double click on this one and it'll open it up. And that's what it's linking to um, is this derivatives folder. So every time, again, I'll go back here for a sec. Every time you run a plugin, you'll get some sort of, pop of node associated with the plugin, whether that be the spade or the TCNE algorithm that's doing the work. If you double click on that node, there will always be a link to get to your derivatives. In this case, the derivative for TCNE is really the movie frames that we've saved so that you can explore the entire TCNE algorithm, how it separates the data over time in the movie. In the case of spade, 
I double click on spade, then I can show the trees or get the zip file. And when I get the zip file, it opens up the actual zipped derivatives folder that has all of that information from the spade run in it. And so again, these, uh, these plugins are doing an external algorithm outside of Flojo, and we have to save the derivatives from those algorithms in some form. And so what happens when you run any plugin, you will always get a new file folder um, containing, created in the same place as your workspace, with the same name as your workspace. So here's my workspace that I've been working on. Here's the derivatives folder. And th that derivatives folder has all of the information about the plugins and uh, their associated runs. Let's see, do I have any more questions here, guys? I'm gonna open, see if I can open this up real quick for so one more. Oh, okay, that's interesting. Okay, I've got a Q&A question from Anna. Uh, there seems to be a lot of smaller clusters. Her question, or her comment is, there seems to be a lot of smaller clusters in CD4, um, in the CD4 island. Do you think they are justified by population heterogeneity revealed by your other markers, or there's some meaningless fragmentation? Um, yeah, so overall, you seem to have way more clusters on this map than what your limited list of channels would imply. So it's a great question, Anna. And if we go back to this CD4 population in the layout editor, I would say. And I've got, yes, I've got a whole bunch of layouts, but if you look at the actual CD4 events, and we could do that here by grabbing the CD4 gated population and displaying it. So I'm gonna open that up and we'll just look at CD4 X versus Y. There's two reasons why I have so many populations. One is that these, there, there's three different stim conditions, essentially, four here, but three different conditions that drive changes in the phenotype sequentially. That is, first, upregulation of the phosphorylation event, and then second, sorry, I'll get back to you guys. There you go, boom, um, X versus Y. Phosphorylation events, and then the, the, the cytokine profile. And there are Th1 cells in this assay in the CD4 population that do express cytokine. And so when I look at this as a density plot and you see all these little nodes, there are two reasons for this. One is gradiated expression of certain markers, such as CD38. If you look at the total CD38 population, let's just drag this on here. So here in green now are the, are the CD4s, and if we uh, kind of zoom in, it's kind of hard to see with the other colors here, you can see that there's a tremendous amount of variation in CD38. There's variation after the stimulation just due to CD, lower CD4, um, because CD3, CD4 can get internalized under strong stimulatory conditions, and so we actually have variation of CD4 antigen expression between the stim conditions. We got variation of CD38. We've got some cells that express uh, HLA-DR in there, but not very much. And then we've got two functional markers that are moving between the different conditions. And so what I think you're seeing with all those little nodes there, those are totally valid changes. I don't believe that is noise at all. It's being driven by the uh, the, the the gradual phenotypes that are different between these different CD4 populations and the, um, and the functional changes that are occurring due to the stimulatory events, the ERK and the interfering gamma upregulation. Okay, I'm just looking if there's any other questions. I don't think there are. And you guys are great. Thank you very much for your questions and your time. Again, if there's any, um, if you would like this, these slides, or if you would like uh, additional information, you can contact me at timc at flojo.com. Our tech support group is always here to help support and, um, and give you information about new features. So please contact them as well with just general questions. But if it's science or technically related beyond uh, just where to point and click, feel free to give me an email as well. We do, of course, record these webinars. And so this will be um, posted up on our pre 
re previously recorded webinars pages over the next couple of days, so you can send people to the webinar if they weren't able to make it today. And uh, it, it, email me with your questions or comments as you see fit, and I'll go ahead and call, call it since I don't see any more questions coming along. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful day. Take care.